Welcome to the channel, everybody, and the Minnesota Twins franchise, now on MLB The Show 18. We are picking up right where I left off on MLB 17, just in the new game, thanks to year-to-year -year saves. And we were right here at the off-season, which I streamed yesterday. It was a two-hour stream or so, and I'm recapping it today. It was a pretty fun stream, and the new changes within the mode for the interface made it a lot easier for me to make sure I wasn't getting confused and I was getting everything done. But we had a pretty successful year two in this series. We did achieve our goal in terms of wins and we came very close to making the postseason. At the end of this year we have three players that retire. Matt Belial, AJ Ellis, and Irvin Santana. No major surprises there. Now, we get into the offseason, and this is our second offseason in the series. And this is really what I've been working towards this entire series, knowing that this was our year to potentially go and make some big moves. We no longer have the large contracts from Irvin Santana or Joe Maurer. We went into the offseason with around $33 million in payroll and no major free agents. Our most important player here was Yunel Escobar, and he wasn't even going to be very expensive. I definitely wanted to keep him around after he was our best offensive player last year. But I knew if there were the right fits in free agency that we had the money to offer big contracts. I did not want to keep all of the veterans we signed last year. I did not end up retaining Brandon Phillips or Jesse Chavez. I wanted to see what free agent would bring us. Now... Joe Maurer's large contract is over, but that doesn't mean his time as a twin is completely over. I still thought he would be a good backup or potential starter, but I wanted to maybe look at upgrading that position. I also gave a contract offer to Eduardo Escobar. I won't show everything from this section because it took a lot of time and it wasn't all that interesting, but I ended up keeping most of the players, and you'll see the ones that I chose not to keep later on in the video. We also had our farm director have a spot opened up, so we had to find someone new for that role. We already have a very good coaching staff, and I wanted to make sure we kept it high quality. We don't have the largest budget in the majors, so I want to make sure we have a great staff so it helps all of our players get a little better. It's not too expensive, but the first person we offered to, Luis Dominguez, ended up accepting the same role with the Diamondbacks, so I had to go and find someone new. I wanted to find somebody who wouldn't have any negatives to our ratings and I ended up offering to Vincent Macbeth who gave us a boost to plate vision among a couple others and he ended up accepting that deal to complete our coaching staff. We also see here we had some contracts accepted very quickly as we retain Yunel Escobar, Eduardo Escobar, and Joe Maurer but we also see a couple big free agents won't be hitting the market Bryce Harper, $310 million contract, and Brian Dozier is staying with the Dodgers. So let's take this to free agency now. These are the players that made it to the open market, and Paul Goldschmidt was on the top of that list, and everyone wanted to see me go offer to the star first baseman. We just had our big contract with our current first baseman run out. It's perfect timing. We have a low payroll. And I knew that Goldschmidt would be a great addition. But I also wanted to see how many different free agents we could possibly get. I was a little worried about boosting up our payroll too much. So I didn't really mess with those free agents right away. I instead went to our tender contracts. Most of these are pretty simple. Just renew contracts for players who are very young. Some of the better young players like Gary Tadano and Maxwell Fowler wanted some larger contracts. So I did want to see what that would all amount to before I offered anything major to a player like Paul Goldschmidt. But there were a few players I wanted to give a fair amount of money to because if you give them very low amounts, even though you have team control, that is going to affect their morale. And I don't want to have negative morale for players I'm hoping to develop. So I like giving those players close to what they want. But we did spend a fair amount on renewing contracts for players from our first draft class of the series. But for many of these lower level minor league players, it's about 50, 60,000. Those are low level minor league contracts here, and those are pretty easy to get done. The rosters are really big in MLB, so this just takes a lot of time. 
Unlike last year, I didn't give out any multi-year deals here to the prospects. I went with one-year plans so that I don't end up messing with morale too much. But again, here is what we had for payroll. Jason Castro was the highest paid player on the team. And outside of him and Buxton, no one really has a big contract at all. And then consider next year, we don't have Jason Castro's contract to worry about anymore. So we're in a really good place at this time to build up this core and spend a lot of money. For arbitration purposes, there were only two players I wanted to negotiate with, and A. Ray Adrianza is not very expensive. Tyler Duffy was an important one to me, but he wasn't going to get a big deal anyway. So that wasn't a major problem for us. There really wasn't a difficult decision to this point. It was just about which free agents I wanted to go after and how much money it was going to cost. So I just took care of this stuff because I'm very new to the off seasons in the show, but the improved UI did make this a little bit easier for me. They cleaned up the menus quite a bit, and that is really the main new addition in franchise. Sadly, I didn't see any major features. There were some improvements to different logic for like trades and retirements, but the menus are the biggest thing, which does help out players like me who aren't as familiar with things. But we go back to free agency, and it was time to give an offer at least to Paul Goldschmidt. He did receive the qualifying offer, which means that if we were to sign him, it would cost us a draft pick, but it was well worth it, I thought, to go after one of the best first basemen in the league and someone who would definitely boost our offense that struggled last year. He would immediately shake up our lineup, but I knew that wasn't the only move that I wanted to make. We made the offer here at $120 million, five years. I ended up looking at our pitching staff, I like our young pitchers, but do we want to rely solely on these young pitchers who are still developing and had very inconsistent years a year ago? Then I looked at our corner outfield spots with Eddie Rosario and Max Kepler. They're both similar in age, their positions, their caliber of player, and what they bring offensively. I wanted to upgrade over one of them, and I knew we didn't have a great farm system for outfield talent. So that was another spot I thought we could get better. But pitcher was the priority, and Dallas Keuchel was one of the top pitchers on the open market. And I had to make an offer to the 31-year-old. He'd give us a great left-handed arm. We're low on left-handed arms in our organization, so that was a good fit for us. And plus... He'd easily be our ace and opening day starter. He had a 3.88 ERA a year ago. He's playing at a very high level. But I wanted to also offer to Lance Lynn. I thought we could get another veteran on there that would maybe be a little more reliable than some of the young players who give us all kinds of outcomes. So I offered to both of them. Then I knew our bullpen needed some help too. We lost our closer, Glenn Perkins, and he was already pretty old. But a lot of these closers were already expensive, and I didn't really want to give a big contract to a closer at this time. I also ended up updating Dallas Keuchel's offer to include a player option to make it a little more player friendly. But as far as free agents, I thought Sean Doolittle was the best option. 32 years old, and I liked the money per year. I wanted him to potentially be our closer, but I knew he'd be the best arm overall wise we'd have in the bullpen, so... He made a lot of sense to give out the contract offer. I then went with another veteran option who actually spent some time with the Twins and I offered a short one-year contract to Fernando Abad. After that, I began to think about outfield and there was AJ Pollock, Charlie Blackman, Carlos Gomez, who was my favorite player when he was a Minnesota Twin previously. He's not the same type of player that he used to be. The speed has gone down a lot. And then Nelson Cruz. I know how much we struggled last year with power. Well, how about adding Nelson Cruz's bat? But he wouldn't be a long-term solution. If I wanted the multi-year starter, I had to go look at a player like Charlie Blackman, who has pretty good speed, he's a great contact hitter, and we could use some high average hitters in our lineup after last season's struggles. I offered contracts to both Cruz and Blackman, but I pulled the offer for Cruz afterwards because I wanted to see where else we could spend that money. And Josh Harrison caught my attention because he can play almost everything in the infield plus the outfield 
and he's very good at hitting against lefties. I'm still not sure how our middle infield situation is going to pan out for the future with Jorge Polanco and Nick Gordon. I thought Harrison would give us a good veteran presence there, and maybe he could play elsewhere if a spot opened up. After making all those offers, it was time to see if anyone would accept. So I sim a couple days into free agency, and Paul Goldschmidt has signed with the Minnesota Twins on a five-year, $108.6 million deal. How about that for shaking up the franchise and making a major signing that gives us our highest overall player? And then you add in a brand new proven ace pitcher in Dallas Keuchel. That completely reshapes this franchise. And at the same time, the Twins also signed Josh Harrison. Those are major moves. And they weren't the only major moves going around the league with Devin Mezzarocco getting a major contract from the Yankees. Kelvin Herrera is going to the Cubs. But Sean Doolittle ends up choosing the Yankees. And I made the mistake of not going through every day to check on offers. I probably could have still gotten Doolittle, but he chose the Yankees on a one-year contract. And once we lost that, I knew we were in some trouble for our bullpen, and I had to go ahead and fix that later on. But after making these key signings and retaining most of our free agents, that boosted up our payroll to $101 million, compared to 93 last year. And we still have room on our roster for more potentially. Normally, when you give out all these big contracts, it really makes an impact financially. But for us, it honestly did not. This is a very minimal boost. And I'll show the numbers again at the end after the roster is more final. I went through to find some other minor leaguers to fill out our roster because I did let some players go. So I still have some work to do on that front, but that isn't really major. I'll find some players that can fit in down at AA or AAA. I offered salary arbitration to Tyler Duffy. I wasn't sure what the holdup was here with getting a deal done. I then opened up some spots on our 40-man roster now that I understand it a lot better. This is where I made my largest mistakes in the last offseason where I added a bunch of rookies to my 40-man roster because I did not understand the Rule 5 draft. It hasn't really hurt us, but now I understand it a lot more and I opened up some space. And these are the players within our organization I did not want to bring back. So like seven or eight minor leaguers we're going to move on from. And then the Rule 5 draft. A chance to maybe add a talented player who a team hasn't been playing. And no one was selected until our pick here. So we had the pick of everyone available. All three of these players. And I was very underwhelmed. I thought that... Chris Sanchez was an interesting player, but he's not a Rule 5 draft pick because he'd have to be on the 25-man roster, I think, all season. And he's just not that caliber of a player. Down the road, he may be, but for us, it's not a good fit at this time. Nobody was selected in the Rule 5 draft, so no excitement there. Now we get closer to the end of the offseason. Most of the big moves have been made but I knew that I still wanted to upgrade this team's bullpen. We didn't have a closer. We have a lot of players in the mid-70s. So I thought that because I wanted to upgrade over Rosario or Kepler, that one of them or both of them could be trade options. So I had to just gauge the market here and use the trade finder. Their stats last year, very similar. They're both lefties with power. They're mid-70s overall. It was hard to pick who I wanted to upgrade over, so I just started putting them in the trade finder to see what offers we would get from other teams. And I wanted a closer or a relief pitcher, and it didn't take long to get some interesting offers, and the first came from the Blue Jays. They were offering us a starting pitcher, TJ House, and Joe Smith. And Smith is an 83 overall relief pitcher. He does have some closing experience, and I thought he'd be a great addition for us. I wanted the veteran who had a pretty decent overall. It was a good fit, but I had to see other offers. I honestly wasn't expecting anything better than that offer, but there was one that was intriguing. A younger pitcher with B potential, maybe he could still get better, Tim Collins. Collins is 5'7", 170 pounds. He's a left-handed thrower with a big breaking ball, 99 break. 
He has really one year of experience and is currently tied to a four-year contract at $2.7 million per season. Then I put Max Kepler into the trade binder, and it seemed like these offers were a little bit better. It had his overall here at a 79, so I thought maybe Kepler was the one we could get more for. I looked around at other relief pitchers. Addison Reed was one that I thought might be a good addition. I believe I saw him in the trade finder at one point. And there were a lot of people that wanted to see me at least see what the offers would be for Byron Buxton. I know we're still waiting for him to hopefully become a superstar, and he's certainly a long way from that, but still has a lot of potential. He's only 25. I want to be patient with him. These offers were very good. But if I'm going to trade Byron Buxton, it's not going to be this year. My first priority is to make him the face of the franchise, if possible. So, no trade for Buxton. I then looked at closing pitchers around the league and saw the Red Sox had two good ones. Craig Kimbrell, I knew we couldn't get him, but Rysel Iglesias was very intriguing. He was an 82 overall, B potential, 29 years old, and he also has closing experience. I wanted to make sure I had that pitching clutch rating high. That was something that the chat was telling me was important. He's on a four-year deal at only 1.5 a season, although that is hurting his morale. I might want to redo that deal at some point if it allows you to in the game. I haven't really gone to see that. The Red Sox did have some interest in Max Kepler. I also added in Adalberto Mejia whom I viewed as a trade option now for a couple of years because he hasn't been developing very quickly in our organization but still has good potential. And then I added in a lower level minor league player, Randy Metcalf, and the Red Sox thought that was a fair deal. So we made the offer and we acquired a closing pitcher for this year, Rysel Iglesias. We still have a lot of work to do to develop this bullpen fully, but this gives us a closer for hopefully a very long time in this series. That was one of our last moves we made. The Nationals did give us an offer, relief pitcher Sean Kelly for, I believe it was Angel Vielma and Lance Lynn. I wasn't going to make that deal, although Sean Kelly would be a decent player to acquire. I thought we'd be done right there in terms of acquiring players, but after looking at our roster, I thought there was one more move we could make. We go back to power hitting outfielder Nelson Cruz, and I thought that we could put him at designated hitter, and we would still have a very good lineup defensively, and this would just add tremendous power to our team. We got the deal done. And that takes us into spring training. After really revamping this team and adding so much talent, we've been looking forward to this offseason, and here's what we did. Six of our seven highest overall players were just added in this offseason, and that's what happens when you have all kinds of room to add talent. If we didn't make these moves, we'd just be in the season with, like, the lowest payroll in the league. This was just such a perfect offseason for us. We now have better contact hitting with Paul Goldschmidt and Charlie Blackman. We get power with Nelson Cruz and Goldschmidt hit 38 home runs a year ago. We don't lose any major players in the process and we upgrade an 84 win roster tremendously. I can't wait for Twins franchise year three. And I'm looking forward to getting into the spring training, which I'm hoping to start streaming a bit of on Sunday. We're going to have a lot of Twins franchise this week with the release of MLB The Show 18. And shortly we'll be on the way to year three in the series. This is a really exciting time for the Twins franchise. And while I still know there is work to do with our young pitching staff and our bullpen and hopefully developing some of our best players like Byron Buxton and Nick Gordon, I know that we're now in a position to potentially go after the division title. And this brings our payroll to 111 million after playing at 93 a year ago. I still have some minor league signings to make, but they're not going to increase the payroll very much. And our cash flow is still two and a quarter million dollars a week. Year three in the franchise is on the way and I cannot wait. I could not imagine us making this amount of moves and still having a very reasonable payroll. 
Spring training should be a lot of fun as we get more familiar with this team and find our starting lineup and our pitching staff. And that'll be part of what we do this week, and I hope to also get into the regular season opening day of year three. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the episode and are excited for the Twins franchise entering its third season. It's an exciting way to kick off MLB The Show 18, and this should be a very fun year. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time.